<laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back to the Millennial Sales Podcast, episode 243. Uh, I'm your host, Tommy Tahoe. Hit me up on Twitter and Instagram under that name, Tommy Tahoe, or LinkedIn, Tom Alamo. Um, super stoked about this episode. Going to give a quick word to our sponsor before we get into the content. Our sponsor today is Postal.io. Uh, Postal is the most meaningful, curated way to send gifts to prospects and customers and partners, uh, whether it be from the local florist, the brewery across town, um, in a digital world where you know we're not taking people out to dinners and we're not building relationships in person uh, yet, it's a great way to uh, build that connection digitally. Um, and I use it and I love it. So you can check them out at postal.io. We've got some fun giveaways and things like that that we're planning for later this quarter. So stay tuned on that. Um, okay, today's episode, uh, we got Josh Roth. Been wanting to do this for a long time. Uh, Josh, I, I've been an admirer, a follower of his for a long time. Uh, he is one of the biggest names in sales development. Um, he's a two-time winner of the AAISP Top Sales Leader Award. Currently, he is the Senior Director of Inside Sales at Lob uh, and the co-founder of the SDR Defenders. Formerly, he was a Senior Business Development Manager at WalkMe, a uh, partner at Presidio, VP of Sales at CarePoint. He worked for the New York Mets. He's obsessed with the University of Oregon Athletics. Um, man, we talk about his whole sales career uh, from the early days of selling in sports. We talk about um, transitioning to tech sales, building up the SDR profession, and, and so much more. So I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. There's something for uh, SDRs, AEs, leaders, all all in one podcast. So without further ado, let's get straight into my episode with Josh Roth. Let's go. All right, Josh Roth, good evening. Welcome to Millennial Sales. How you doing, man? Tom, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. It's good to uh, it's good to have you. It's been a long time coming. We've been kind of like social media friends for I don't know how long, like two years or something. Uh, it feels like at least, and uh, it's good to be be actually chatting. Man, it's been a while. I, I'm used to following uh, Tommy Tahoe around uh, around <laughs> social media. It's good that we're actually uh, chatting on on a Zoom here. Absolutely, man. Absolutely, we've got a ton to get into. Uh, I've been super impressed with, you know, just kind of following you from afar in your career. So I think you've got a ton of info that I think is going to be helpful to the audience. So I want to get cracking. Um, I'd be remiss not to start with what's hanging above your right shoulder, uh, which I believe is an Oregon football jersey. You seem to be a passionate uh, Oregon football fan. So um, I know you went there for, for undergrad, but did you, were you working there after graduation as well or did you get straight into sales like or was there a little bit of a gap so um i was working in the athletic department uh during my time at oregon and then slightly after graduation um i was doing more like communication social media stuff um and then uh i moved into sales shortly after um i was actually advised to if i wanted to get into sports sales i should work at the annual giving program at oregon and that was my first ever sales job. And um, it was, you know, one of those like smile and dial, you know, you got off the phone and the software was already calling the next number. So um, that was my first experience with cold calling and uh, funny story. So the first person I ever uh, uh, spoke with uh, in the annual giving program was Patrick Chung, who is an Oregon safety, is a legend, yeah. patron safety. And uh, after the first call, I, you know, I, I saw the name come up. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like, there's no way I can actually make this call. I remember thinking I'm never going to have a career in sales. And uh, here we are. <laughs> did he answer? Uh, he did. He, he was super nice. Really, really nice guy. You didn't um, get him on a donation, though. <laughs> uh, I, I, did, I did not make the sale. I did not make the sale. I'm pretty sure like he was so nice. I was just stuttering and, and stammering over, over every word. I mean, I was just tripping over myself left and right. And he put up with it on the call. Super, super nice guy. Uh, but I, I did not make that sale. <laughs> That's hilarious. I got to ask before we get into more sales stuff, University of Oregon. I mean, the, for anyone that's a sports fan, like the football team is so iconic. And for someone that went to a school with, with just over 2,000 people, to think of that stadium rocking on a Saturday night, like 
can you just tell me about that for a minute? I need to live vicariously through that situation. Ooh, uh, it, it's, I mean, it's home. Like it, it really is home. <laughs> like when I think about my happy place, like I think about Autzen stadium when it is just rocking, like the, like it's deafening. You lose your voice by like the second or third quarter. Um, at, you know, the, the, duck leading the team out on the harley motorcycle and then you got shout at the end of the third quarter like it, it's just it's just like a big party um and it's it's up in at oregon i mean it's like a religion up there um yeah. you know like you talk about it all year you know what games are you going to and um needless to say i'm very very excited to uh head back to Austin this fall that's awesome do you make you make it up there like for a game every year or a couple games at, at least yes yeah and, nice. and, you know, Oregon's coming to Stanford. I'll be at that game as well. You know, I'll be rocking the green and yellow. So um, I'm I very it. excited. I love it. Um, so it, a pretty natural transgression from being like a big sports fan, you know, being involved in that at Oregon to getting into uh, your first sales job at the at New York Mets, it looked like, right? Yep. So uh, walk me through that a little bit. Like what's the... I feel like the dream when you're maybe starting in sales and you're a sports fan is like, Oh, I'd, I'd love to just spell like sell for a pro sports team. That sounds unreal. And there probably are some good parts. Maybe you get some free games, but um, I imagine at least from what I hear, it's also really just such a grind. So I think I'm sure that there are other jobs that are just as grinding, but a sports sales job is just about the biggest grind you'll have in sales. So to give you a perspective, you work a normal day, Monday through Friday, every single week of the entire year. So, you know, 8, 8.30 to 5.30 were kind of like the typical hours. Um, but then you also work the game. So if it's a night game during the weekday, you're there from 8.30 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And if it's a homestand, you're there, you know, 9 to, you know, 8.30 to 10, three days in a row, six days in a row, whatever, whatever it might be. And then you got to work the weekends too. So um, it all depends on the calendar. I mean, you know, for us, like we would really hinge on that calendar when it came out, like what holidays are we off? What holidays are we not home for? And then what holidays are we home for? And then where are the homestands, right? Where are those two to three homestands where you know you're going to be working two weekends in a row plus those entire weeks? I mean, there, there was, remember there was a, a, a stretch my first season where I worked like 30, three days in a row or something like that. And I remember the first day that I had off, I didn't even do anything. I literally just slept the entire day. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it was, it, you know, you do that for years and years of, of your life. I mean, it, it's just an absolute grind making, you know, I was making 120 calls a day at that point. Wow. And so you're, you're selling like trying to sell season tickets or like package tickets, I imagine, but like, what do you do during the games? Are you with clients or what are you exactly doing during the game yeah so um so it's definitely like suites season tickets um group tickets like anything that is not a single game ticket that's that's what we're that's what we're selling um and during the game like really you're just visiting all of the clients that you have so you know you get a little report that says oh you know here's all the clients that are at the game and you kind of just like run around the ballpark just trying to visit as many people as you possibly can um, you know, like I remember when I first started, I, I didn't really have the organization to think like, oh, um, here's where the office is, right? I need to, these are the routes I need to take to be as efficient with my time. Like I wasn't organized in that way. I would just run around the entire stadium trying to visit as many people as I could. And then yeah. as I got more experienced, you know, I recognized, okay, you know, here's the routes I can take to be as efficient as I possibly can. Um, yeah. And I, I would also start like, as again, as I got more experience, recommending seats closer to our office so that it was easier for me to visit people. Yeah. So I, I imagine after like a couple of years of that, it looked like you crushed it there. Uh, you got to be like a player coach role, which I'm familiar with, which is its own level of grind as well, <laughs> on top of what you're already talking about. Um, at some point, you were probably just like, I got to get out of here. Like, was it as simple as just like, man, I, I cannot be doing this for the next like 10 years and maybe tech is like the place I should try to check out next. So that was a big part of it. Um, you know, for me, like I really wanted to be in an innovative role at an innovative company and um, sports is 
generally not that. Not saying that sports cannot be innovative, but um, baseball is a very antiquated league. Um, yeah. You know, you're working 81 additional days, you know, out, out of the year. Um, and, I, you know, I remember thinking I didn't want innovation to be defined as moving the pitcher's mound forward or back by an inch. Um, and so I started thinking about tech. I had some conversations with folks in tech and realized like, boy, if I put in literally half of what I'm doing now, I would be just as successful. And, and that's kind of what started the thought process to transition. And, and then, so it looked like your first gig in tech, you like, you kind of killed it. Uh, like come and swing out of the bat. I feel like nowadays you see someone that comes in from a sales role, maybe in a different industry it seems like they have to start as an SDR or maybe as an AE. It looked like you came in, maybe it was just the right time, right opportunity, but it looked like you were, you managed maybe one rep and then it grew to 20 plus 20 or 20 plus reps that you were leading. Um, was, was that the first gig that you had after the Mets? So it, uh, it was not. Um, so it, that was where I kind of worked to, but my first gig was um, at this super small little um, tech recruiting company. And uh, it was a player coach role. I managed three people and it, it was not the right fit for me. Um, the recruiting <laughs> industry was, was not, uh, was not, you know, I think well suited for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that some of the, uh, some of the hiring practices at this company um, was, it, it didn't fit with kind of where my um, uh, ethics, ethics and morals were, um, you know, I, I was told mm -hmm. to try to hire people, um, for free. And, and, um, you know, the, there was challenges there, you know, there was a lot of turnover. My heart wasn't really in it. I didn't want to hire people for free, um, and, yeah. and ask people to do free work. And, and so that was, that was not the right role for me at the time. And I learned very quickly that, um, you know, different types of tech, different industries require, um, uh, you know, different leaders. And I just realized that like, that was not the right industry for me, but it, it led me to, um, the role that you're talking about, which is CarePoint, where um, it was very much a, a different environment. You know, that was a, a very early stage company. There was one salesperson, um, and that was you know it's an early stage SaaS company. It was it was all hands on deck. You know, it yeah. was where you know who can we chase? Who are who are the right targets? Who are the right personas? What are the right use cases? It was very much a learning experience, and we we certainly grew very quickly. Um, and I think there was kind of an assumption that we would raise um, a fairly large A round. You know, we had gone from, uh, you know, zero, you know, we we're pre-revenue to about 2 million of ARR pretty quickly. But um, I wasn't a part of the, the discussions, but for whatever reason, we had a, a lot of trouble raising around. And um, ultimately, uh, you know, our CEO said, hey, I can't pay anybody. Um, you know, mm. I'll give you triple the equity, but can't pay you. And, you know, that was where... Um, you know, the vast majority of our team decided to, to move on. And I was encouraging that. Um, funny enough, though, one of those people uh, is now on, on our team at Lob. He actually referred me in. So, okay, there you go. But funny, funny how things work that way. The long tail. Let's, let's talk for a second about player coach. So you've done that role at least two times. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on it for the people that haven't done it? Enlighten us what that's like. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't, I don't mean to be that, that, um, uh, uh, serious about it, but it's hard. It, you know, I mean, like you're getting one salary to do two jobs, um, and you're being asked to do a hundred percent of, of the, you're being asked to do a hundred percent of, of effort in two areas, right? You know, you got to sell, you got a quota to hit, but you also got to manage people. And, and I think people assume that managing is just an easy check mark, you know, Oh, you know, that that's easy. You know, everyone wants to get into, into sales leadership, sales management, but um, it's a really big ask. And unless you're getting compensated for two roles, um, I, I would, I would advise heavy caution when having those discussions. Totally. When I, I did it for about 18 months, which was only supposed to be six months. Uh, and it's, it's like, you, you really can't give more than 80%, like in either bucket. Like if you give a hundred percent in one of the buckets, the other one's just going to be empty. Either your team's going to be empty or your own revenue is going to be empty. And then 
you know, you puts you in the spot of saying, well, if he can't handle this job, then he can't handle the next one. Well, it's like, that's, you know, that's not really true. So I, I, um, I thought it was kind of like, you know, this maybe kind of shining light, this step to the promised land of getting into leadership. Um, where now I tell people, I strongly advise people if they're given that opportunity to not take it, uh, unless, you know, really they have to. It, it, it's so funny. Like it, 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 what I heard from you there is, is it's almost this, this trap, right? You know, yeah. it's this shiny light that you think is going to get you into sales leadership. And then, you know, the rug gets pulled from under you and, and you realize, oh my goodness, you know, I need to work 16 hour days if, if I want to accomplish both. And unfortunately you can't pour from an empty glass. Totally. Yeah. It's, um, if I were being a little more pessimistic, I think it's just, a, it's also a way for a sales leader to get you, keep you interested long enough if you want ambitions of leading without actually giving you the title or without, maybe there's not that, that role doesn't fully exist in the company, which it was for me. It's just like, hey, this, we don't have enough reps for you to be a full manager. It's like, okay, I'll be a half manager, I guess, you know? And so um, that, that, I think that's part of the situation too. And if you're ambitious and eager, you're probably willing to take it on at least for part of the time it's like you know the equivalent of being like a you know unpaid intern or something where you're just like you're really hungry and you want the, the experience and the learning but at some point it's like all right i i need something else i need to actually get you know you're you're paid for what you're actually doing yeah i could not agree more with that um you know it's it's difficult to be it's difficult to do one job well right um you yeah. know we all got quotas to hit you know daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, but, um, at being asked to, to work two jobs, um, it is, is a big ask, um, particularly when, you know, it feels a little bit like, you know, you're, you're kind of chasing after the carrot, right. You know, like, yeah. let me grab it, but it's, it's just out of reach every time. Yeah, totally. Um, I'm curious where, if people know you from, uh, LinkedIn, uh, they're probably familiar that you were previously at walk me before, Obviously, they IPO'd uh, fairly recently, so congrats to the team over there on that massive success. Uh, I'm curious, from your time there, when 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 in their journey did you join? Like, did you already know it was, it was a special place, and like, hey, we're headed towards this crazy trajectory, or was it early enough where there was question marks and there was maybe this turning point that that got you guys there? You know, I think it's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah. I recognized pretty early that it was, it was a special place, uh, honestly, because of the person that hired me, um, uh, gentleman, Aaron Zakowski, he is genuinely, you know, one of the, the best sales leaders out there. Um, you know, he, uh, he's never on LinkedIn, so I'm sure he, he will never hear this, but he, you know, to this day, you know, he is, is still a mentor of mine. He is still a friend of mine. Like the first interview I had with him, uh, I, I felt like there was the possibility that we would connect because his first job out of college was actually at the San Francisco Giants. Mine was at the New York Mets. So we kind of had that in common. And uh, my, my favorite uh, artist is Bruce Springsteen. And somehow that came up in conversation and he was like, oh, you'll never believe this. You know, Bruce played it at um, the Giants stadium and, you know, he was doing a sound check. So he played, you know, three songs during the sound check. And I was the only one there and I'm just like rocking out alone. to Bruce <laughs> It was such an incredible story. I remember like, you know, trying to like pick my job off the floor um, and working with him was genuinely special, you know, watching the way he built the BDR organization at walk me and the way that he built relationships. I could tell that it was special. Um, but I have a, another buddy of mine who's actually a, a buddy of mine from Oregon who I had chatted with prior to the interview process. And I actually asked him some of those questions that you asked me and he gave me kind of a, who knows, you know, we want to, but you know, it, it keeps not happening. And, and so I figured that the chance was there, but there needed to be some buttoning up. There needed to be a little bit more polish. Um, and when I realized, uh, I guess to answer the last question, when did I realize we were getting there? Um, I would say end of last year, um, there was a lot that we were doing that um, it, it had kind of the, the smell of really being a polished company. Um, you know, we started putting guardrails uh, around things that weren't guarded before. 
um, we really started to hone in on the process, the repeatability, the scalability. Um, and that's when I realized something, something's going on here. Um, and then as, as we started to grow, as we started to, to really crush no, our numbers, um, you started to really get a sense that it was, it was getting pretty close. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, I'm curious, you mentioned that sales leader as being a mentor of yours, uh, even to this day. I'm curious, like, I'm sure you've worked for several other great sales leaders, and I'm, I'm sure you've met a ton just through your journeys and through networking and events and all this stuff. How do you, how do you handle that, those relationships? Like, how do you kind of keep that fire burning with someone that, say, you consider a mentor to you? Yeah, you know, I think for me, like, I always just try to, it sounds a little silly, but um, I always just try to fire off a text every, you know, if I haven't talked to him like once a quarter, I always think about like at the end of every quarter, like who haven't I talked to, you know, who, who should I ping that, you, you know, I haven't heard from, or I want to chat with. And um, my, uh, my first couple of managers from the New York Mets, Michelle Price and Brian Towers, um, they certainly fit that mold as well as, as two people that I've, I've considered a mentor since day one. Um, you know, Michelle gave me a couple of, of early gems and, um, uh, that I still use today and in, in kind of the way that I try to lead and, and try to manage, you know, Brian very much the same. So I always try to ping them and, and um, you know, just catch up, right. It, you know, just kind of like see where they're at and, and um, it, you know, just keep in touch with them because it's those types of people that you don't want to lose. You know, those folks you always want to have in your corner um, from a selfish perspective, but um you know, also, I think that it's important to recognize that you also give something in that relationship as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I certainly hope there are people that that feel the same way about me, but, um, uh, you know, there are folks that I would, you know, chat with and, and still do who, um, you know, I feel like might view me in, in a similar way. I can only hope. Um, yeah. And, you know, you still get something from them too. Like, how is, how is the game changing? Like, what are you seeing that's working for you? What are some things that you've identified that are best practices? So um, it's never a one-way street. And I think it took me a while to realize that. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, like if they ever wanted to go into tech sales, right, you know, I would certainly hope that they would come to me before they go to anyone else. Yeah, yeah. And it, it just makes them feel good, I'm sure too. You know, like as I've grown through through my career, which is still relatively early. You know, there's a few people that are just starting that I've I've started to kind of help and, and mentor a bit, and it just feels good to help someone out. You know, especially yeah. if you know when you talk to them that they're actually going to if you give them advice or they ask a question, you know, they're going to actually do the thing. You know, and you know that they're kind of working towards it. They're not just like asking just for the sake of asking. Um, but that stuff just feels good. So. The other side definitely gets something out of it and uh, and wants to build those relationships. I feel like just as much as we do. Totally, Could, yeah, totally align. So on the flip side, um, I love I'd love to, to spend some time talking about the SDR Defenders uh, because I, I see just the name is just like oh that's badass, you know? Because we've we've kind of got we've kind of have a, a love hate relationship with SDRs just like the public you know the linkedin sales public right like we had this time where i felt like every all people were doing were praising SDRs it's the hardest job in sales like shout out to my SDR this and that and then we had like a phase where people would just call out SDRs like yeah. their email and like their with their name on it on linkedin and like shaming them and now i think we're probably somewhere in, in between those two points um but talk to me a little bit about like what the genesis was of just a, first of all, a, a brain trust of people uh, at the head of it, but, but why you decided to start the SDR Defenders. All right. So this is actually one of my favorite stories and I'm so pumped that, that you asked this. So the SDR Defenders started, um, Kyle Coleman shot me a text message. We, we had met at a um, then revenue collective now, now pavilion yeah. Um, dinner prior to the pandemic. And we had um, kind of hit it off and talked about how much, you know, we felt like the SDR community needed support. And one night, you know, it's like 6.30, Kyle texts me and he goes, hey man, um, if you're free, would you mind hopping on LinkedIn and defending SDRs um, on this LinkedIn post? This person is talking about how SDR should only stay in their lane and only make phone calls and emails. And so of course I, I did that, but then I kind of started texting with him. I was like, I feel like there's something here. 
Like, yeah. I feel like there's actually a community we can build to specifically support SDRs because like no SDR should ever be bashed, right? Like you either have done something well or you can learn from it, right? Like right. throwing something on LinkedIn is not going to help anyone, particularly with their name on it. Like, come on, right. you know? Um, yeah. And we just kind of like started talking and, and um, you know, just through like different channels, um, you know, that's where Tom and Nisha and Nikki uh, came in. So Nikki posted the other day about what her genesis was. She had posted on LinkedIn a, a big post about, you know, how important it is to defend SDRs. And again, you know, Kyle uh, on his LinkedIn game <laughs> sends me a, a text or maybe tags me in her post and says, you know, hey, Josh, check this out. I just commented like, hey, Nikki, got, you know, awesome post, got an idea, text me um, or, or I'll DM you or something. And we ended up on the phone talking about, you know, uh, this this community that we wanted to build and um you know it it just kind of started this like let's not only defend SDRs but let's give SDRs guidance and support to um to to really help them um in their careers understand like what they're doing is really hard and there are people here that want to support that want to enable and that want to help them grow because I think to your point, unfortunately, uh, as, as frustrating as it is to kind of admit or say, there are people out there that will not offer that, that unconditional support and, and enablement and, and kind of the, the cheering section behind SDRs, right? And, and yeah. one thing that, that Walk Me CRO Shane Orlick always said, which always resonated with me, was like, there's no harder job than being an SDR. You know, the SDRs are the fuel to the fire. It's what he always said. And, and that's the way that I try to approach my day to day is, is like, how can we support these folks? Because it's so easy to just, you know, bash an SDR, right? Oh, your outreach wasn't good. Like, great. You know, it's a really hard job. It's hard to do good outreach. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, and I think that it, that's really the genesis of it. We really wanted to support and enable this community. Yeah. And I had Kyle on the show. Maybe it was around this time because he went on a rant about uh, you're not just an SDR. And that was the name, I think, is episode like 172, if my memory serves me. But it was uh, around the same the same topic. You know, people like an SDR saying, oh, I'm just an SDR. I can't do A or B or C, you know, uh, with the point being you're not just that. You know, you you have real value that you're adding to the organization and, and everything like that. Um, that's a great that's a great uh founding story just the, just the late night text from Kyle Coleman about a LinkedIn post the uh the I I think as opposed to a, a late night booty call I think this is like a, a late night <laughs> LinkedIn call <laughs> yeah <know? laughs> that, that's hey, you, hilarious you, you coming over to this LinkedIn post to comment <laughs> defend SD cards <laughs> so um and and to think about it like and we all people fuck up in every single job. Like if yeah. if the if the procurement person like does a bad job negotiating or something, you don't call them out on on LinkedIn and say like, "Hey, Josh, like did a terrible job on this negotiation for this contract." Like, can someone please like publicly shame him? It's just such an odd thing that people do that. It, it's so funny you say that. Like, I think about the same thing with like just bad leaders, right? Bad managers right? No matter how bad a manager is, they're never going to get shamed, right? You know, I'm sure you and I have both had people that, you know, we felt were not good managers, right? But at yeah. no point are we going to go on LinkedIn and say, this person was a bad manager, right? Yeah. But somehow it's, it's become okay to do that for SDRs. Like, get out of here. <laughs> like, are you serious? Like, I, 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 it, it shocks me. It frustrates me, but it also just saddens me. Like, these are people who are 22, 23 years old who have literally just started their career that the most emailing they did was probably to a professor to get an extension on a paper or something. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. like, let's give them some space. Let's give them places to grow, right? Because your first year of, of your, your career is so critical, right? I mean, mm. that's when you're learning. That's when you're picking up new skills. That's when you're watching what goes on around you. Right. So if you're being slammed on LinkedIn for let's call it what it is doing your job, right. That right. is your job. Right. And to be slammed like that, it, it, it shakes someone. Right. Totally. You know, I, like, 
I saw a couple of years ago, um, uh, Barstool Sports released a, an email from a New York Red, a New York Mets salesperson, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking like, that could have been me. You know what? Yeah. Like, like if that was me, would I have just quit? Like, would I have been too scared to do my job? I mean, the person was literally doing their job. And I looked, I literally, you know, I clicked into the link. I looked at the email. I'm like, I sent this email 15 times, you know, 15 times in a day. Like (laughs) it really wasn't even that bad. And I'm thinking like this poor salesperson's being shamed on, on barstool sports across, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of eyeballs for doing his job. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's so disappointing to see that. And then, you know, to actually see people that are getting, you know, again, tens of thousands of views on LinkedIn who might be considered an influencer are slamming SDRs. Like you should, you should go in like a penalty box for something like LinkedIn's <laughs> got to put you in a penalty box for doing that. <laughs> so do, my opinion is that it's also partially like the system's fault for this, right? Because like, I don't know who to blame, but, you know, in general, the, the, the prototypical, you know, sales leader or SDR leader, right? More dials, more calls, more, 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 right? More versus better or more is better. And when the top people, you know, the top titled people, the VPs and the C-suite folks of the world are getting 90% of this outreach and because the SDR that doesn't really know what they're doing yet in a lot of cases, right? They're just starting their career. They're just getting told to like send a hundred emails, make a hundred calls. Like there's only so much quality you can put into those. And because, you know, you're forced from your boss to send a certain amount, then the quality is going to be poor. And so to me, I almost feel like I don't know who to blame, but, but the finger to me really gets pointed at the leadership for not coaching them to be better or holding them to unrealistic volume measures. You're so I'm, uh, totally aligned. Like, I think you're spot on there. And, and, um, you know, I think it's important. Like I understand that you don't want to die on a vine, right? Like you need enough quantity going out there yeah. that you can get something in. But what that does not mean is that more is better. Right. And, and I'll give you an example. So at walk me, um, one of our, our reps, he was three months in was hustling m- more than anyone else. Right. He was the more right? He was making the most styles. He was prospecting the most, right? But he wasn't hitting his numbers. And he, and he comes to me and he's like, Josh, like, I don't know what to do. Like, I have not booked a meeting in three weeks. I'm going to miss my number this month. I missed my, my number last month. Like, what am I doing wrong? Right. And, and, you know, we dug in and we were like, all right, like, let's figure this out. We dug in and everything. And I came out of it. I was like, like, go take a walk during the day, go work out, go like stop staring at a screen right yep. because it, you're clearly doing everything right it may just be that like you need a clear head right so go clear your head and sure enough comes back hits his number that month he's, he's starting to like go take walks during the day and he becomes one of our best reps i think he actually uh when i left walk me he was i think the best walk me enterprise bdr and mm. I think back to that and I say like, not everything is just a quantity game, right? Some of it might be, but you need to dig in and figure it out. And and for the the leaders out there, like you need to be willing to get granular. You need to be willing to go in and double tap in and understand what is the messaging that's going out? What is your approach to the account-based selling? How are you prospecting? Who are you prospecting, right? What's your, what's your cadence with your, your AE, right? Like, you need to be willing to get that granular because if you don't, then you definitely won't get the right answer, right? Yep. But if you are willing to get that granular, you can figure out, is it a messaging thing? Is it just, you got to clear your head, right? But in order to do that, you need to seek to understand first. Mm. I'm curious, um, you know, you, you've had so much success uh, as a rep, as a leader, specifically in sales development. Um, I've got a few last questions for you. One is like, why sales development, right? Like you could take these leadership powers and go to be an AE manager or, you know, something else, but at least for the last few gigs, you know, including your new one at, at Lob, I believe is, is still focused on sales development. So I'm curious, why is that, why are you so passionate about that form of sales? So it's a great question. Um, 
sales development to me is a broken industry right now. Um, I think that there are a lot of systematic challenges in sales development, but first is you are literally teaching reps how to be account managers, how to be account executives. And if you don't have that experience yourself, it is really hard to teach someone how to do something that you have not done yourself. And I'm not saying do not promote SDRs to SDR managers. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that I think that the way that the industry is set up is not, um, is not conducive to a good function. So for example, at WalkMe, we did promote one of our BDRs to a BDR manager, but we flooded him with resources so that he could train people how to be an AE. We actually required him to go through the BDR to AE certification that we developed. We actually required him to um, uh, b- basically tag along on in-flight deals so he could mm-hmm. hear how to how to process it, right? You know, we just pushed so many resources his way to ensure that he could teach and train people how to be an AE and AM without having that experience. And I think that right now, if you look across sales development, there is a lot of leaders that just don't have either AE experience, AM experience, or just all that much AE experience, right? Maybe they've got a year, maybe they've got six months, but they haven't actually had enough at bats to teach and train enough scenarios. Like have they closed enterprise deals? Have they closed um, transactional deals? Have they closed growth deals, right? Like there's so many different types of selling that it's it's hard to give that training if you haven't done it. And yeah. I'm very passionate about really setting up SDRs, you know, BDRs for that next step. And one of the things that I was so pumped about at WalkMe was every person that we promoted from a BDR to an AE crushed their number. One of them, one of them pitched like 400% to his number. And, and like that, that's really where I get excited. And, and that's why um, sales development to me is, is such a key function. I love it. Um, I've got a couple kind of quick hitters for you uh, before we wrap up, if you're cool with that. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, So we're big learners on this podcast. Uh, I'm curious, books, podcasts, YouTube channels, people you follow um, that have been influential or impactful for you. uh, It doesn't have to be sales, really. It could be really anything, but anything that stands out to you. Um, One book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, This was on uh, President Obama's uh, recommended books uh, a number of years ago. That was one, it is not a page turner by any stretch, but it uh, personally, I had to reread it three to four times to actually like figure out how to think about things differently. But I I love the book because you really have to, it forces you to think differently. Mm. Um, So that'll be my one takeaway because it's, it's, it's that it, it was that impactful for me. I love it. Um, top, you said Bruce is your guy. What's your top Bruce song? Ooh, uh, Girls in Their Summer Clothes. But it's very close between that and Born to Run. Okay. Well, Born to Run is just like the classic. It's just the a classic, classic goat. You know, I was actually thinking this the other day. This is not planned. And I might even mess up the song name, so don't ridicule me. But I was thinking, you know what the best Bruce song is? 10th Avenue Freeze Out. Is that what it's called? Oh, yeah. 10th Avenue Freeze Out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think that's the song name, but oh, boy. Uh, I think I'm going to embarrass myself because I don't know if that is the song name, but I certainly know what you're referencing. Well, we'll have to look it up, but that's my vote. Um, that or Glory Days. Um, Glory Days is a great one. That's a good one. Uh, what, do you got, what do you got playing in the Spotify right now? Is it, is it Bruce or you got something else going on? Ooh, uh, so I transition between three uh, playlists. My uh, my my current favorite is my Ocean Avenue playlist, which uh, if you're familiar with Yellow Card, <laughs> that's the song I'm referencing. It's kind of that like '90s, 2000s uh, pop. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of my uh, my you know throwback playlist I call it. And then I'll, I'll transition between that uh, country music um, and uh, a Coachella playlist. <laughs> I'm all go. over the map. You're all, it just depends on the mood. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. My last question for you, I'm curious, anything that you do outside of the office that you think really makes a big impact to you uh, at work, whether it's, you mentioned like working out, taking walks, maybe it's reading, maybe it's listening to Coachella music in the morning, uh, but anything stand out to you? 
Two, um, I love walking my dogs. Um, I mm-hmm. think it's really great to just kind of like get out, zone out and just kind of go for a walk. Um, I think it's it's very kind of recentering. Um, I don't know if that's a word, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, I'll give it to you. And the second ha- has been like, I really, uh, I really enjoy just kind of like flipping on CNBC and watching whether it's like fast money or closing bell, like um, just kind of hearing what's going on, like what's going on in the market. Um, you know, how could that potentially impact what we're doing? Um, those are two things that, that have been helpful. Yeah. What, what type of dogs do you have? Uh, one is a beagle and she is uh, very independent. <laughs> and the other is a Formosan mountain dog, which I didn't know that that was a breed until uh, I not only had already adopted him, but uh, I was walking on the beach and a woman points at him. What a great Formosan mountain dog you have. A, a what? He's a lab. <laughs> didn't even know. <laughs> Did, didn't even know, but I looked it up on, on Google. I was like, oh, I, I stand corrected. We, we've got uh, we've got a short list of, of potential dogs to be purchased in this apartment. Ooh. It's a big, that's the big topic at hand right now. So I'm all, I'm just trying to get some, some third party research. What, what's uh, what's your stack rank? What, what are the top, top three? Well, one is just like getting one in, in just in general, like, should we get yeah. one? Uh, and can we that, get that's it a yes. in this? I didn't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and can we get it in this apartment? Uh, but right now, near the top of the list, we've, we've got uh, some fr- French bulldogs are hot in the streets. People love those things. Uh, yep. Those are pretty cute. There's some sort of terrier. I can't remember the, the real name of it. Those have been the top two right now. The okay. Lakeland Terrier, I think. All right. Those are the leaders in the clubhouse. Those are the leaders, but we've got plenty of, we got plenty of time for an upset to come in. We're very Ooh, early uh, stage. You, you let me know if, if you ever want uh, opinions or, or, uh, anything like that. And we'll, we'll talk offline. I might have a, a potential solution for you. <laughs> okay. I, I'll, I'll take all the opinions I can get. Um, Josh, I appreciate you coming on, man. Um, congrats on all of the success uh, just throughout your career, but especially, you know, the new role at Lob, uh, Walk Me Success, SDR Defenders, everything else you got going on. Um, any last words that, or anything we didn't get to, and then obviously let the people know where to best get in touch with you. Uh, I uh, honestly, I got nothing else, Tom. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I've been such a, a big fan of the millennial podcast for quite a long time. You do such an awesome job shining a light on, on, um, v- very, very incredible millennials and, um, super, super thankful that you had me on. We'll have to, we'll have to go grab wine or something like that, but, um, I don't have anything. If anyone wants to get in touch with me, feel free to, to shoot me a connection on LinkedIn. Um, you know, shoot me a message, video message, anything. Um, and, uh, follow Tom. That'll be my action item. You gotta, you gotta follow Tom. This guy, this guy is absolutely awesome. Um, and, uh, just does really, really incredible work. I still, Tom, I still don't know how many, like, feel like there's two of you and you're like, like <laughs> one person like does like your social stuff and the other person actually yeah. sells, but, um, you're, you're incredible, man. I don't know how many hours in your day you have, but you really make the most of them. You're a good I appreciate example it, man. Everybody. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. And, and thanks for coming on. Absolutely. My dog says thank you as well. (laughs) Thanks for having me. What's up, everybody? Thanks for checking out that podcast. Uh, Happy July to you. Uh, Would love if you took 22 seconds and hit subscribe wherever you're listening or watching this. Uh, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, your favorite podcast player. And be sure to check out some of my content on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm Tom Alamo. And on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at Tommy Tahoe. Have a great day. Make it legendary. Peace.